Everyone's talking about China as one of the world's top travel destinations, but with so much on offer, it's hard to know where to begin. Now you can follow a group of Lonely Planet authors as they hit the road to discover the best that China has to offer. Caught in Yongchun late and tired, personally. Uh, head chef now. In this episode, they get a taste of the food that built a nation. China! <laughs> oh, right on the nipples. <laughs> China's cuisine stretches back over 400,000 years, so this is a country that spent a lot of time getting the recipe just right. Eating here is steeped in symbolism and ritual. In fact, the Chinese are so serious about maintaining the yin and the yang in their cooking that Confucius was once quoted as saying he'd rather starve to death than eat with the wrong soy sauce. Travel across this vast land, though, and you'll soon discover that its cuisine is as varied as its geography. Each region has its own unique style and signature dish, and in the nation's capital, that dish is Beijing duck. We sent Lonely Planet author Daniel McCrone off with a bicycle pump and asked him to discover the secrets of China's most famous meal. I'm heading towards the Tianmen branch of Tuen Zhu De. This is the mecca for Beijing roast duck aficionados. And I'm hoping to meet a couple of master chefs who are going to help me crack the code for how to cook the most authentic Beijing roast duck. Beijing duck, also known as Peking duck, has headlined imperial court menus from as far back as the 12th century. Its fame and popularity spread to the commoners more than 200 years ago when royal chefs began to set up their own restaurants, and it's been popular ever since. The 150-year-old Tuenzhu De restaurant serves up to a staggering 5,000 duck dishes per day. Wow, we're entering the Tuenzhu De Hall of Fame. Pele's been here, yeah. Fidel Castro. If it's good enough for these guys, it's good enough for me. At the heart of every Beijing duck restaurant is a wood fire oven. They're crucial to give the duck its unique taste and texture. When the government threatened to ban all wood fire ovens during the 2008 Beijing Olympics to help reduce smog in the city, it caused a huge uproar from duck restaurants. To find out how to roast a whole duck in one of these, I'm meeting up with the restaurant's master chef, ah, chef, chef Zhang. Oh. Hello, ni hao, ni hao. How long have you been roasting ducks at Quan Zhu De? Sanjian. Oh, yeah. Wow, 31 oh, years he's been here as a chef. This is the master. <laughs> <laughs> Whoop, let's go roast some ducks. Wow. I've heard that the uh, the skin is very important on the ducks. So um, in order to make them uh, really really crispy, people used to blow into them. I brought something which might be able to help for this. He's going to love this. I brought a bicycle bike. We can just fix this on to the bottom here and then and then okay, they've already prepared it, so so there's no need. The process of preparing a duck is no simple operation. Through a small hole, the ducks have to be blown up like a balloon and massaged until the skin is separated from the body. The chefs then baste the duck with hot water to tighten and crisp the skin. What's really the secret recipe? We just use this because it looks good to make the, the colour of the duck that kind of lovely golden colour. Every bit of flavour is just pure duck. The ovens used by these chefs today are the originals from 1864, when this restaurant first opened. For fuel, they use Chinese date, peach or pear wood to give the duck a subtle, fruity flavour. This is where the action really begins. This is where ordinary ducks become Peking roast duck. Okay, we're going we're to we're we're try and put the, uh, the duck in the oven. Apparently this is uh, something that only skilled chefs can do, but I'm going to give it a go. Ah, uh, look at this. Use the jousting, the jousting rod. Uh -huh. 
it's too long. It doesn't fit in the, uh, the oh. mouth of the oven. See, so the duck's got to fly into the oven. Oh. 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 That's pretty heavy. It's a lot heavier than you think. And the, the pole's really hot. Right, now I've got to fly it in at an angle so it gets in this quite small oven now. Let's see if we can do this. <laughs> okay, I don't think he's very happy with that. <laughs> Ruined his fire. Okay, I've, I've messed up this duck already. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of burnt, it's singed the, the leg of the duck. One, two, three. Okay, I just completely knocked the duck off the uh, off the hook there, and it's landed in the in the embers of the oven. But Master Chef saved it. Cheers, <laughs> Andrew Wire. <laughs> so these are all the ones that are done. He puts them over the fire just just to give them a, a, an even an even roasting, because obviously some parts of the oven are slightly different heat to the others. Uh, looking at these uh, Master Chefs in action, it's like they're dancing, doing the roast duck tango. <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> 不不用等一百年是吧一个小时一个小时一个小时 We only have to wait an hour for these to, uh, to roast, thank God, because I am starving. Beijing duck is traditionally carved in front of diners and served in three stages. First, the skin is served, dipped in sugar and then garlic sauce. The final step's my favorite, wrapping the duck skin and meat in pancakes with scallions and sweet bean sauce. Oh, look at this. The duck has arrived. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Amazingly, these master chefs will carve 120 slices from each whole duck. Okay, yeah, there we go. Three pieces of duck meat. Bowl it that way. <laughs> Not bad. I don't know if I can get this in my mouth. Mm. How good is this? I'm in the best roast duck restaurant in Beijing with two master chefs eating authentic Beijing roast duck. In Shanghai, the locals source their favorite food from the Yangtze River Delta and the East China Sea. No marine life in these parts is safe from being plucked from the water and popped in the steamer. Eels, abalone, shark's fin, and jellyfish all receive top billing, but there's one enigmatic dish that the locals prize above all others. Lonely Planet author Marika McAdam goes trawling for answers at the Tong Chuan Lu wet market. Paris has foie gras, Moscow has caviar, and if you ask any self-respecting Shanghainese what their ultimate taste sensation is, they'd say da ja zie, hairy crab. It might not sound like something you want to put in your mouth, but I'm about to meet a foodie who's going to try to convince me otherwise. Hairy crabs are freshwater crabs native to East Asia, and can be found from the southern Fujian province of China to as far north as Korea. The tastiest ones are believed to live in the Yangzhou River, where it empties into the sea at Shanghai. The city's proximity to Crab Central means that places like Tong Chuan Lu Market are always well stocked. This is where I'm trying to find local culinary expert Christine Liu, who's agreed to help me get to grips with this hairy crustacean. Christine! Well, it's hard to find you in a crab shop in a city full of crab shops. Yeah. But nice to meet you. What makes you a hairy crab lady? <laughs> Not the hairy crab lady. Um, I just love food and I'm passionate about cooking. Well, you'll be surprised to hear this, but I have never had a hairy crab. Then you never left. <laughs> the tradition of eating hairy crabs is believed to have started as far back as the Western Zhou dynasty more than 2,000 years ago. Today, a single crab can cost more than 50 US dollars. 
But the hefty price tag doesn't seem to stop the Shanghainese from feasting on them during the autumn crab season. This is my local supplier. Ah, and here are the local crabs. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me why it's so special? For Chinese, we, we say it's very sweet taste. Is there anything that we can tell from the color? Yes, on top here, it's always green. And if you've got a nice dark green, this is good crab. Okay. Yeah. Now, you look at this cover here. If you see a very pointed one, this pointed here, yeah. it's a male. All right. The other thing you can tell is a male, and they always have hairy legs. Hairier than, yeah. hairier than women. Female, Quite you know, normal. they shave their legs, but they all have hair on the legs, okay? Hairy crabs spend most of their life in fresh water, but they head for the ocean to breed in late summer. Females develop a creamy, soft row in their bodies and fetch a higher price at market. Now look at it, this is a female. Can you tell? Because there's no pointy bit. No it's pointy bit, round. it's a nice mm -hmm. round one. And they usually, because they have so full of eggs, here is thicker. This is a, a, it's a bulge there. Yes. And there's less hair on her. Are these the best hairy crabs there are? Okay, now, these are from Taihu. Hairy crabs can come from a couple of areas. The best one are from Yang Chang Hu. So the only guarantee of getting real Yang Chang Hu hairy crabs is to pull them out of the lake yourself. Correct. Two hours out of Shanghai, Yangcheng Lake is considered the hairy crab equivalent of the Champagne district in France. It's estimated that up to 15 million hairy crabs crawl across the lake bed during harvesting season. The clean water and shallow depth means sunlight helps grow the seaweed that these prized crustaceans feed on. Mr. Young, thank you so much for meeting with me. I have been tasked to get hairy crabs straight from the source at Yang Chang Lake, so who better to meet with than the head of the Hairy Crab Association? The harvest starts in late September, allowing the crabs to grow to maximum size. Traditionally, fishermen would attract the crabs into their nets with a bright lamp. But these days, a simple bait-filled net is used. Yangcheng Lake's hairy crabs are so revered in China that counterfeiters have been caught selling pricey imitations at market. Local producers now laser tag every single crab they catch. So you're tagging it so purchasers know that it's a real Yangcheng Lake crab. <laughs> Can I take this one? Okay, so how do we do this? Okay. There you have it. Caught in Yangcheng Lake and tagged and tied personally. The Chinese have a long-standing love affair with local ingredients, but there's one foreigner that gets them all hot under the collar. The chili was introduced to China in the 1500s by Portuguese and Spanish traders, and it sparked a reinvention of regional cuisine. China's south and west embrace the fiery pepper with a vengeance. Lonely Planet author Daniel McCrowan sweats it out on the hunt for a red-hot favorite. arrived in the village of Shaoshan, the birthplace of Chairman Mao, no less, as well as being the founder of the People's Republic of China and the most famous guy in China's modern history. Mao was also a lover of food. I'm here to find out about some of the dishes that made the man tick. Hunan province has a reputation of cooking up some of China's spiciest cuisine and even rivals the fiery palate of Sichuan dishes. Hunan's best-known resident, Chairman Mao, used to say, the more chilies you eat, the more revolutionary you become. Mao Shu Shu Shuba. Hey, I'm Daniel. <laughs> Ming Jun's family lived next to Mao Zedong for more than 20 years. He's offered to give me some insight into the life of the former communist leader. This is my house. This is my house. This is my house. This is the house. This is Mao Zedong. This is Mao Zedong. This is Mao Zedong. Though Mao's legacy is not untainted, 
The local Chinese often show a deep respect when confronted with his image. Mao's home was a mass pilgrimage site in the 60s and 70s, and it's estimated that over 40 million people have visited Shaoshan for a glimpse of his birthplace. Looks like a kitchen. So was this where he used to make Hong Shao Rou? Uh -huh. uh, okay, so if they had guests around, they would cook Mao's favourite dish, Hong Shao Rou, in the big pot, serve it up to the families that, that came. We have an inscription down here. It was by the side of the kitchen that Mao Zedong had gathered the whole family together for meetings. He encouraged them to devote themselves to the cause of liberation and the Chinese people. So this is where it all happened, in the kitchen. To ensure he had a regular supply of Hong Shao Rou, Chairman Mao traveled with a Hunanese chef who could correctly prepare his favorite dish. Ming Jun's family opened their first Mao-inspired restaurant more than 10 years ago, based on the former leader's preferred Hunanese recipes. Well, look at all the Mao memorabilia. Cooking the recipes that appeal to Chairman Mao has become so popular, there are now over a hundred Mao family restaurants spread across China. <laughs> Ming Jun's mother, Madame Tang Ren, developed her early culinary skills on some of Chairman Mao's favorite dishes. Many are old village recipes handed down through generations. Mao Zedong in the village, he was very small. He was very small. So this is smelly tofu, chou tofu. Mao Zedong apparently used to say that this is very smelly, but tastes really nice. Still very fragrant though. I think Chairman Mao was right. Smelly but tasty. Hunan cuisine relies on a contrast of flavors, like spicy and sour or spicy and sweet. The dishes all share a distinct fiery taste created from fresh chilies. Very juicy. Madam Tang suggested I join the chefs in the kitchen to learn the secrets of Hong Shao Rou. Zhang Chef, uh, 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 <laughs> So this is where it all happens then. Hey, hey. Oh, head chef now. To make Hong Shao Rou, Pork belly is traditionally cut into large chunks, with the skin left on to keep the meat succulent. It's then plunged into boiling water to partially cook the meat. This is a special sauce that they put on. It gives the Hong Shao Rou a kind of ready color. The sauce is a simple mixture of caramelized sugar and Chinese rice wine. Ginger, star anise, chilies, and cassia bark are added for extra flavor. They do this for at least an hour while this is cooking. I'm gonna go and check out Mao's museum. We'll come back and try this later. The Mao Relic Museum is spread over 19,000 square meters and contains over a thousand of Chairman Mao's personal artifacts. This is apparently a giant replica of the seal that he used to use on his official letters. Apparently it's priceless. No detail is spared. On display are Chairman Mao's old manuscripts and even his worn-out old toothbrushes and cigarette tins. This is Chairman Mao's favorite bathrobe. Apparently it has 73 patches on it and he used it for more than 20 years. Chairman Mao wanted to live a very frugal life, so rather than just buy a new bathrobe, he'd patch it up. Chairman Mao eventually left Shaoshan to go and rule the country, but he came back in 1959. And this is a little mock-up of his homecoming. This reminds me, actually, I've got to get back to the village Check out how my Hong Shao Rou, Mao's favorite dish, is getting along. Zhang Shufu, where are you? Better put the hat on. Just one piece at a time. Okay, one piece at a time, with the skin facing upwards. There we go. My very own Hong Shao Rou. I'm going to go and try it out on some of the customers. Uh, yeah, yeah. I want you to try out uh, my very own Hong Shao Rou. You mean Xian Chang Chang? Oh. It's not good. It's not It tastes just like it should do. 
Very good. Even though I do say so myself. It's been interesting to see how this traditional recipe has gone from the mud hut villages to being served in a top restaurant like this to a table full of VIPs. I'm just relieved they all liked it. Have a look. It's a table full of happy customers.